right before Hebrews, the book of Philemon. should be about one page in your Bibles, a very short little letter. That's what we'll be today. And uh, hey, listen, if, uh, if you're a little uh, taken off guard by the slack crowd and maybe even sometimes in a situation like this, in a room this large with so few, sometimes it even feels a little uncomfortable. You understand what I'm saying? Sometimes it just feels a little strange. And so if you're feeling a little awkward, I, I was praying about it this morning and and uh, one of the worst things for a, for a visitor to do to go to a church is to go on a Sunday when there's no people there. And so I was praying about it because we have, we have a list of visitors that we've been working with and hoping will come. And, and so I was praying about them and I was praying about the service and about the spirit of the service. And, uh, and the Lord took me to Luke chapter number 2 in my devotion this morning. And uh, for those of you that know uh, Luke 2, that is, the, that is right after Christ was born. And eight days after his birth, they took him to the temple uh, to perform the sacrifices that were necessary for a brand new baby boy. And, uh, and so the first time Jesus went to church, there was one old man named Simeon. And there was one old woman named Anna. And then his mama and daddy. And they were the only four people that were even involved in the service, as far as we know. And, uh, and so Jesus' first service, which, was, which would have been a really good one, uh, just had two old people and two young people. And, uh, and so it don't matter if the crowd is large or if the crowd is small. God can move. And you know what happened in Luke chapter number 2? God spoke to Simeon, the old man. God spoke to Anna, the old woman. The Bible says she was of great age. So she's an old woman. God spoke to Joseph, the young man. And God spoke to Mary, the young woman. And so God can move even in small uh, services, and so I hope the Lord will bless your heart this morning out of the book of Philemon. Uh, we started studying this on Wednesdays, and uh, my, my goal was to teach out of Philemon all four Wednesday nights for the month of July, and uh, many of us have uh, committed together to read this little letter every day. How many of you have been doing that, been reading Philemon every day? And, uh, and so I wanted to bring um, this lesson, I taught it Wednesday night, but I wanted to bring it to, uh, to you this morning and, uh, and revisit it a little bit and go over some of these things we find in the letter of Philemon. Now, by show of hands, how many of you are familiar with this book of the Bible? You know what's going on here. All right, what's going on in the book of Philemon is the Apostle Paul is in prison in Rome. And there is a man in Colossae named Philemon who has a slave that has stolen from him or done something to him, <clears throat> excuse me, and has run away and he has ran and found Paul there in a prison in Rome and his slave's name is Onesimus, we learn that in verse number 10, and he gets saved in prison talking to Paul. Paul leads him to Christ there in prison and then sends him back home to Philemon with this letter encouraging Philemon to forgive the man who had done him wrong. That is the essence of the book. It is forgiving somebody that's done us wrong. Now, I can guarantee you that all of us sit in Philemon's seat. Somebody has done you wrong, and it is the will of God for us to forgive them. But like Philemon, we have a hard time forgiving somebody who honestly doesn't deserve it. You know, that's, that, that, that's the true test of our faith and of our Christianity is if we can forgive those that don't deserve it. What did Jesus Christ say on the cross? Father, forgive them that know not what they do. What did the martyr Stephen say as he was being stoned to death for preaching the gospel? He said, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. In his heart, he was forgiving people that did not deserve it. Now, we are quick to forgive somebody who pays us back. We are quick to forgive somebody who tries to uh, right their wrong and give us something. We're quick to do that, but what about the person that can't? And, uh, and so this letter is about forgiveness, and, and I want you to look in verse number 4, 5, and 6 with me this morning, and, uh, and I want to see a, a, a truth that I believe will help us uh, be a better Christian and be a, better, be, a better, uh, be a better soul, be a better person, be a better husband, be a better wife, a better parent. In verse number 5, he says, Hearing of thy love and faith which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus and toward all saints, that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing 
which is in you in Christ Jesus. He goes on to say in verse number 9, he said, Yet for love's sake I rather beseech thee, being such a one as Paul the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ, I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds, which in time past was to thee unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and to me. Look in verse 15. He says, For perhaps he therefore departed for a season, that thou shouldest receive him forever, not now as a servant, but above a servant, a brother beloved, specially to me, but how much more unto thee, both in the flesh and in the Lord. If thou count me therefore a partner, receive him as myself. If he hath wronged thee or oweth thee all, put that on mine account. I, Paul, have written it with mine own hand. I will repay it. Albeit I do not say to thee how thou owest unto me even thine own self besides. Yea, brother, let me have joy of thee in the Lord. Refresh my bowels in the Lord. Having confidence in thy obedience, I wrote unto thee, knowing that thou wilt also do more than I say. So he writes to Philemon to forgive this man Onesimus. And I'm going to take my text in verse number 6 that he says that the communication of thy faith may become effectual. And so his goal is for Philemon to become effectual. Now, I want to make a bold statement that I don't want to hurt your feelings, but it is true that some Christians are effective and some, some Christians are not effective. Some Christians' faith has an effect on others and some Christians' faith has no effect on others. Some Christians' faith has effect on their own life and on their own selves. And some people's Christianity doesn't even have an effect on their day-to-day -day life. They are saved. They have their get-out-of-hell-free card. They are not going to spend eternity in the lake of fire, but you can't tell they're a Christian by anything that they do, say, or how they act. They have no effectiveness. The word effectual means active. It means operative. It means powerful. And th I thank God I've known some very powerful Christians in my life. I've known some very powerful men of God. I've known some very effective, some very active, some very operative women of God, some Christians that had an impact on my life. And I hope and pray that uh, we can all become effective Christians. Uh, I, I would have you notice in verse number 2 that Philemon has a church in his house. I mean, he likes church so much he has it at home. Now you understand they didn't live in the day that we live where there were church buildings designated where you can go and have church, not, not gospel church. If they were going to have church, you had to have it at home. And, uh, and so he's willing to pay a great price just to have church, welcoming uh, people into his own home to, to, to preach the gospel. And, and no doubt Paul had been in this man's home and taught the, taught the scriptures and preached the gospel of Christ and and in verse number 7, Paul says of Philemon that they have great consolation in his love because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. And this man, Philemon, was, was good to people. He was good to Christians, and he has a church in his house. And I'd say he's got a good list of good deeds, wouldn't you? Would you agree with that? Yet all of that becomes ineffective over one lost relationship. All of the good things he has done become ineffective if he can't forgive somebody who's done him wrong. All of the services he's had in his home, all of the messages Paul has preached in his living room, all of the people that he has refreshed and been, been a blessing to, it all becomes ineffective over one lost relationship. It'll taint... If he can't forgive this man, it will taint his name. It'll taint his testimony. It'll taint the ministry. It'll taint the work of God. The church in his house will become known as the church that doesn't forgive. It'll become known as a church led by a man that cannot forgive somebody who done him wrong. Now, no, 
no bones about it, Onesimus done Philemon wrong. He, verse 18, he says, if he, hath, if he oweth thee aught or if he hath wronged thee. And he has been wronged by somebody, just like you have been wronged by somebody. But isn't it, isn't it, just, isn't it just like God to let all of those things come to a head and, and, and fall on one lost relationship? I know a whole lot of Christians who have done a whole lot of good, but it's all been tainted and tarnished by bitterness. I mean, I know Christians who have gone to church for a hundred for a hundred years, for fifty years. That's, that's close. But I know men and women that have been in the ministry and been in uh, an independent Baptist church for their entire life and they have worked on buses, they have taught Sunday school, they have done all these things, but towards the end it all comes down to they just can't get past what so-and-so said or what so-and-so did. And all of their good works and all of their efforts and all of the giving and all of the going has all been tainted by unforgiveness. Even though the Bible is so clear and it is so pointed to forgive those. And, and Jesus even said in Matthew that if you don't forgive your brother, why should Christ forgive you? And it becomes tainted by unforgiveness. But the flip side of that is while one lost relationship can make him ineffective, one restored relationship can make him more effective than anything else he's ever done. Most of you have probably at least heard of Philemon in this letter about forgiveness, but I bet you hardly any of you knew he had a church in his house. And I bet, I bet hardly any of us knew that he was a man of consolation like Barnabas. Why? Because forgiving one man has outshined every good thing he's ever done. Look in verse number 15. Paul says, Perhaps he therefore departed for a season that thou shouldest receive him for how long? Forever. He said, God's given you an opportunity to do something eternal. And Philemon's gone down in history as a great man of forgiveness. And very few, very little attention is paid to the fact that he had a church in his house. Very little attention is paid to verse number 7 about refreshing the saints, but how many sermons and how many books have been written and preached about forgiveness because it made them effective. And it is my wish for all of us that we not just be Christians, but we be effective Christians, effectual Christians, Christians that have an effect on other people and even effect on ourselves. There are three characteristics of effective Christians that I see in this text that I want to give you this morning and I hope will be a help to you. In verse number 5, I want you to see effective Christians love. Effectual Christians love. He said, hearing of thy love and faith which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus and toward all saints. Effective Christians love. You're going to have to hit the button. There you go, brother. Uh, if you're going to have, if you're going to be effective, you're going to have to love. And I want you to look closely at the verse. Hearing of thy love and faith which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus and toward, say the next two words, all saints. Not all these saints, all saints. Now you may not think that means very much, but if it says all these saints, then that love is very specific to a certain group of people. It becomes narrowed such as probably everyone in this room loves everyone in this room. But how much do you love the brother going to Victor Baptist Church this morning? How much love do you have for the people at Fairview Baptist Church this morning? How much love do you have for the people that were at the last church you were a member of? How much love do you have for the last pastor you sat under? It was not specific to a certain group of believers. It was to believers in general. It was to all that were in Christ, which is a very, very profound thing for Philemon to 
to, to believe and to feel in a day when such high walls separated race from race and bond from free and men from women and lost from saved. But this new faith in Christ made them all one. One baptism, one Lord, one faith, one salvation, one spirit. It made them all one under Jesus Christ. And effective Christians love the believers even if they're a little bit different. Yeah, I know that ain't popular now. It ain't popular to let, now it's popular to love sinners no matter what. It's popular to love and accept people no matter where they are. But if you believe one hair different from us, we can't really fellowship. If you don't have the right this and the right that, and, and if we don't line up just perfect, and if we don't dress the same, I was shopping for my wife. Can I just rant for a minute, y'all, okay? I was shopping for my wife, and I was, uh, I can pick out a suit, but I'm not real good at picking out purses and, Stuff and it was supposed to be a surprise. Me and Mason and and uh, and we were at the mall shopping and and this lady just happened to be standing by there and I had I had the purse picked out. And I was trying to get the shoes, trying to get the shoes and I had two pair and I couldn't decide. And this lady was just happened to be standing there and I said, "Ma'am, which shoe goes best with this purse?" And uh, she said, "Well, what's it for?" And I said, "Well, uh, you know, my wife's going to wear this to church." And she said, "What kind of church?" She said, is it a contemporary church or a Baptist church? And I said, <laughs> oh, she said Baptist. I never, I didn't, when she said what kind of church, I didn't, it's just kind of like, I don't know. I don't know what I'm walking into here. <laughs> and I was really wishing my son wasn't with me, but because uh, I really wanted, anyway. But uh, So she said, what kind of church, contemporary or Baptist? And I wanted to say, what's that matter? What does that matter? Why, why, why can't we all wear, why does it matter what we wear? Hmm? I think you ought to wear, wear your best to church. That's, I mean, that's what I think. But I don't know. Anyway, I said, it's a Baptist church. And she said, those. <laughs> she said, you need to, you need to get those. Don't, don't get the other ones. She said, that would be okay if it was a contemporary church, but, but not, for, not for a Baptist church. And that just goes to show you how divided we are. We are so divided, even in the faith. We, we disagree on so many points, and I understand doctrine is doctrine, and it is worth dying over. And you can't read Baptist history or church history without, without seeing the amount of blood that was shed for doctrine. I'm all for doctrine. I'm all for being right. But effective Christians love. Now look in the verse now. Hearing of thy love and faith. So we will quickly see that love comes before faith. We will quickly see that love comes before faith. We will also see that the Lord Jesus comes before the saints. The Lord Jesus comes before the saints. Last week, I think it was last week, I, I had my son stand with me and I said, you can't love me and hate him. Then I said, you can't hate my wife, my bride, and love me. Now, he said, you love Jesus, then the saints. Now, there is a group that would love the saints and not love the Lord Jesus. That's the big community thing. I, read a, I, had, I received an article this week, Brother William, on, on four ways to reach the unchurched. Four ways. Four concrete, tried and true methods to reach the unchurched. And I thought, oh, that's great. I know the answer now. I've got four steps. Yeah. I'm not even going to tell you what the four steps. I'll tell you what one of them was. One of them was have a 5K for a good cause. Have a 5K for a good cause. The other one was, was feed the hungry. And you know, Brother Derek, in all of that, that, that whole page article, the name Jesus Christ was never mentioned. The gospel was never mentioned. The cross was never mentioned. Not a single Bible verse. Is there Bible verses to feed the hungry? Absolutely. Is there Bible verses about being good to all men? Absolutely. But they didn't use any. And it was all about others and nothing about Jesus Christ. The church received a letter. And it was a formal church apology. It was a church apologizing for what kind of church that they have been. And you know what it was all about, Brother Stephen? AIDS in Africa. 
And it was saying that it was on the churches, it was the church's fault that there's a continent that is dying because of AIDS and HIV. Now, should we care about the sick? Yes or no? But the church was not instituted to fight disease. The church was instituted to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And there is a side of religion that is all about people and has no room for Jesus. Jesus must be first. Jesus must come first. What good is it if we give somebody medicine, food, and clothes, and shelter, but they die and spend eternity in hell? I'm not, I'm not against doing good things for the community. We do things for our community. We love on our community. There's nothing wrong with doing good to people. That is a biblical concept. But we must love Jesus more than we love people. Amen. Hearing an effective Christian's love. But, I, but, but, but let, let's see this now. Hearing of thy love and faith, which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus, love comes before faith. Now, I believe the teaching we can see there is that even when you can't believe in somebody, you can love them. Because there are times it is hard to have faith in the Lord Jesus. But you still love Him. There are times where you can't understand what He's doing. There are times you can't believe He just did what He did. There are times where... You flat out disagreed with the Lord Jesus. Can I get a witness? I mean, if you were God, you wouldn't have. And you've probably told him so. You've probably prayed a prayer like this. Lord, why? How can this be fair? Right? But that didn't mean you didn't love him, right? Even though you couldn't at the time believe what he was doing and your faith struggled, you still loved him. And so should it be with the people of God. There are times where you say, I can't believe he did that. But you still love him. I can't believe that they have done this. And I am so disappointed and I don't know that I can ever trust that woman again. But you still love them. I need a little more help other than from Miss Tammy. I mean, is it, am I telling the truth? Am I telling you the truth? There are times, all right, every, every parent in this room has been in a spot where you said, I can't believe my child's done this. I cannot trust my child any longer with this area of life, and I can't believe this has happened. Yet you still love that boy, and you still love that girl. And so it should carry on to the believers, to the saints, to the family of God that we love even when we can't believe in others. You see... Philemon is not living in a greenhouse where there are no problems and where his faith is fertilized and fed and everything's just easy. He's living in a world much like your world that is cursed by sin and is just filled with problems. If you were here for the society message out of this book, you, you see all the, the problems that Philemon is living in the middle of and, that, and Philemon lives in a place where it's just difficult to be a Christian. And you and I live in a generation where it is difficult to be a Christian. It's not easy. And only the effective are going to succeed. Only the effectual Christians are going to pass the test. Philemon is being tested. His love is being tested. His love, his forgiveness. Can you forgive someone that does not deserve your forgiveness? That is a test of your love. It is a test of your faith. And only the effectual Christians pass the test. All would say amen to God loving the sinners. All would say amen to God loving the saints that still live like sinners. But few say amen to the saints, always loving the saints, even though they are still sinners. You wouldn't bat an eye at God loving someone that doesn't deserve it. But you got a hard time letting your love go to someone doesn't deserve it. Effective Christians love. Look in verse number 6. Effective Christians not only love, they also look. 
that the communication of thy faith may become effectual. How? How are we going to become effective Christians? By acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. How are we going to become effective Christians by acknowledging or by looking at what God has put in you? When you got saved, He put some things in you. He planted some things in your heart. The Holy Spirit of God moved into your heart. And then the fruits of the Spirit, which are love, joy, peace, patience, long-suffering, temperance, so on and so forth. God puts some things in us, and only the effective Christians that can forgive, only the effective will look inside at what Christ has put in them and not ignore it. The opposite of acknowledging is to ignore. How many of you, don't say amen, how many of you have ignored a conviction? How many of you have ignored a nudging of the Holy Spirit? That voice on the inside that tells you to call so and so and make things right? That voice on the inside that prods you to make an apology? That voice on the inside that prods you to do something Christian? How many of you have ever ignored that? Oh, if you're honest, every hand would go up if we were going to do it out in the open. And he says, I want you to become effective or effectual, and you're going to do it by looking at the things God has put in you. And he says, every good thing. Every good thing. Just turn to the book of Galatians. Let's look at these good things that God's put in us. Right before the book of Ephesians. Galatians chapter 5. Every good thing. While you're finding that, I will make this statement. There are many fruits of the Spirit. Sometimes we have one dominant fruit and the other goes unused. It is almost like the other fruits aren't even there. Galatians 5 and verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. The fruit of the Spirit is love. Well, we could just stop there and just focus on the love that God put in our heart, but that's not what Paul said to do. He said, I want you to look at every good thing. So look at love. Look at joy. Look at peace. Look at long-suffering. You know what long-suffering is? It means to put up with somebody. It means to forgive and then forgive again and then forgive again and then again and then and do it for a long time. Long-suffering. Gentleness. Look at gentle. Look at goodness. Look at faith. Look at meekness. Look at temperance. Self-control against such. There is no law. Look at every good thing. Don't just look at one. Acknowledge every good thing that God has put in you. Now Paul said in the book of Romans, he said, I know that is in my flesh that in me dwelleth no good thing. Paul said, there's nothing good in me. Yet he tells Philemon to look at all the good things that are in him. Then he says, in Christ Jesus. Because the only good thing in you is Jesus. If there's any good in you at all, Jesus put it there. If there's any goodness in you, if there's any love, or if there's any joy, if there's any peace, if there's any long-suffering, the Son of God put it there. We are to look at what God has put in us. Oftentimes we will say, I'm just not that kind of person. I'm just not that forgiving. I'm just not that patient. I'm just, I don't have that in me. Well, if you're saved, you do. If you're saved, you do. The other day, me and my son were on our way to the, to the hardware store, and he wanted to know how big the thing is we were after. And I was driving. I said, about the size of your hand. And he looked at his hand, and he said, wait, your hand or my hand? Because if we're getting something the size of my little boy's hand, we're going to get something quite small. But if we're getting something the size of his daddy's hand, we're getting something a good bit bigger. 
And a lot of times when God brings us to a test and we have to forgive somebody, we look at ourselves and just say, I'm just not that kind of person. I just, I just can't let things go. I don't have the kind of patience. I don't have the kind of heart. I don't have the kind of depth. I don't, I don't have it in me. I know you don't have it in you, but it is in Jesus. And quit looking at your small hand and look at your father's hand and forgive the woman, forgive the man, let the bitterness go and move on with life and find a way to love again. But you're going to have to stop looking at you and look at Jesus. Look at the good things of Jesus that are in you. Effective Christians love. Effective Christians look. But I want you to see this last thing in verse number 16. He says, not now as a servant. I want you to receive him not now as a servant. That's how he left. Receive him as a brother beloved. A brother beloved. I want you to re- forgive him, receive him back, but not how he left. I want you to promote him from servant to brother. Because effective Christians not only love and look, effective Christians lift. They lift others up. And he said, I want you to take uh, uh, Onesimus and I want you to forgive what he's done. He says in verse 18, put it on my account. If he owes you, I'll take care of it. He cannot repay you. He cannot make it right, but I will take care of it for you. I want you to forgive him, receive him, but that's not all. Promote him. You see, we have it in our minds that forgiveness is just putting up with somebody. Just for the rest of your life, you're just going to put up with them. You're going to let the deal go, let, the, let, let it go, and then you're just, going to, you're just going to tolerate them for the rest of your life. You're going to go to the family reunions. You're going to go to family get-togethers. You're going to go to church with them, and uh, you're going to stay on the opposite side of the church. And, you know, we can go to church together and all, but, you know, that's, that's about it. And we're just, going to, we're just going to put up with them. But forgiveness is not putting up with them. It's putting them up. It is lifting them up. It is elevating them. And it is letting go of all, uh, uh, everything that they ever owed you. It is changing the, the, the relationship status. And, and from now on, they are not master servant. Now they're brothers. Now nobody owes anybody anything. Instead of expecting something out of Onesimus, now Philemon just respects him as a man and as a brother. And you can't tell me our churches can't use a good heavy dose of that. Oh, we'll let them come back to church, but it's never going to be the same. It's never going to be the same. Oh, we've all seen it. We've all been through it in church or in family. And we'll get past it and, and we'll talk about it and, and it will, you know, we'll spend a, a little bit of time away and just kind of back off a little bit and, and just lay low for a while and, but, and then we'll be able to fellowship again and just kind of get back around. But it's never going to be the same. That's not forgiveness. Well, it's not effective forgiveness. It's not effective forgiveness. Look. Look at verse 11. I hope this is making sense to you. He said, In time past he was to thee unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and to me. And as he closes the letter, he names some men that are with him. Look at verse 23. There salute thee Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus. Say the next name, Marcus. And know who Marcus is? That's John Mark. That's Marcus, nephew of Barnabas, the guy that wrote the Gospel of Mark. You say, why why is that a big deal? Well, because in Acts chapter 16, John Mark ran off on him. Marcus left him. He bailed out on him. And then him and Paul and Barnabas were going to go on another missionary trip and Barnabas said, hey, let's take Marcus with us. And he said, uh-uh, he ain't going with us. He'll quit. He'll leave us. And we, we can't have somebody quitting on us and leaving us. 
And the Bible says that the contention between Paul and Barnabas was so sharp that they broke up. And Paul took Silas and Barnabas took Marcus and they went separate ways. The first church split. But later on, Paul will write to Timothy in 2 Timothy 4.11 and he'll say, bring Marcus to me because he's profitable. And at the end of this letter, somebody that Paul had pushed away <laughs> who had run away from him. <laughs> Marcus had run away from Paul just like Onesimus has run away from Philemon. And he's asking Philemon to forgive his runaway because Paul had forgiven his runaway. And he says now he's profitable. He's profitable. You see, Paul was practicing what he preached. He was practicing what he preached. These weren't just pretty words that sounded good. This was what he truly believed. This is how he really lived. And he had forgiven Marcus and brought him back into his fellowship. And it was no longer, well, I'll just tolerate you from a distance. He promoted him to his team and said, I want you with me. I want you to be a part of my ministry. I want to serve God with you. Oh, there's a lot of people you'll go to church with. You probably wouldn't go in prayer room with them. And Paul was practicing what he preached of lifting somebody up. Not just putting up with them. But truly putting them up. No longer ever expecting anything from them. Not not thinking they owe you anything. I would probably dare say that if, I, if we had an honest view of your heart, you think some people owe you something right now. You've got a list. They owe you something. They owe you an apology. They, they owe you a good work. They owe you amends. They, they owe it to you to take the low road and let you be on the high road and, and to honor you and to give some. They owe you. That's in your mind. It's in our heart. It's what our flesh feels. They owe us. And if, you're a, if, you're an, if, you, if, if you have a servant that works for you, he owes you every single day of his life. But now, through Christ, through this effectual forgiveness, he no longer owes you anything. Now you're just equals. That's what effective Christians do. That's what effectual Christians do. They love always. They, they look Within. They don't live from the outside in. They live from the inside out. What a God we could get a hold of that. Too often we live from the outside in. Our day is dictated by what happens. Our mood is dictated by what we see and what we hear and instead of coming from the inside out. He says, I don't want this compassion, this forgiveness to come from the outside. I want it to come from the inside. Effective Christians love, they look, but they live. True forgiveness is being able to promote somebody. I'll close with this. Miss Leslie, can you come? Everyone's probably familiar with Joseph in Genesis, where he was sold into slavery by his brothers. He winds up in Egypt, and he's got such a good spirit about him, he was promoted. There's a man named Potiphar. And Potiphar had a wife that was a horrible woman. Horrible woman. And she had her eye on Joseph and she wanted him. And every day she tried to seduce him and he would not. He said, this is, I would not, this is wrong, I would never do that. And one day he was, she caught him in the house by himself. And she laid her hands on him. The Bible says that Joseph just took off running and, and left his coat in her hands, getting out of Dodge. Well, then a Potiphar came home and she told a lie on him. She said, look, he came in to, to mock me and look what he's done. He even left his coat when I hollered out. Potiphar took a hook, line, and sinker, put him in prison. Well, some time goes by, a few years. No, Joseph's been down there interpreting dreams. Potiphar went and got him, took him to the king. You know what Potiphar did? He had forgiven him. He knew he'd been lied to. He had forgiven Joseph. Then he put him before the king. He said, this is the man. And he is wise. He promoted him. 
he praised him to somebody else. I mean, out of his mouth came praise for Joseph. And I know you say you've forgiven that brother in Christ, but do you have anything good to say about him? Because if you don't have anything good to say about them, you've not forgiven them. Not effectually. You may have in word, but you have not in deed. And you have not in your heart. That's how you become an effectual Christian. That's how a Christian passes the test. Let's stand on our feet.